Okay, what are we going to talk about? This is always extemporaneous, so I don't even know what I'm going to talk about until right before I come out. It's kind of what I've done for eight years, and it's somehow worked. Well, anyway, the topic presentation was the path ahead. And I tend to think in trends, and I tend to think in philosophy, because at the end of the day, I, if I talked about my products, it'd either be boring or it'd be shilly. So let's make it worth your time and mine too. So I've been in the space since 2011. I often tell the story that uh, I signed up for a meetup group in 2011 and only two people attended. Well, two people signed up, myself and another person, and only one person attended, me. <laughs> so I had a great conversation with myself. It's wonderful. And now we're a global movement. You know, we're a huge movement. I was in Mongolia. I ran into a camel herder outside of Lombatar. He had Bitcoin. Think about that. Eight years' time, you go from nobody taking you seriously, everybody saying that you're just crazy, you're nobody, to people in Mongolia buying your stuff who don't even have an internet connection and they live in a gear. We've made a lot of progress. So what's the point? The point is that we're too used to looking at the local. You know, Bill Gates has a great saying. He says that people tend to overestimate what they can do in a year and underestimate what can be accomplished in 10 years. 10 years' time, we've gone from nothing to global movement. Look at cell phones. The iPhone comes out in 2007. Look at it in 2017. Look at what that did to the world. Look at how it changed it. I recall being in Tokyo on the subway in one of the cars. Every single person in the car had an iPhone or an Android device, and they were looking at it. No one was looking up. We now are all permanently hunchback because of this innovation. So, Technology has a way of creeping up on you in, in a very gradual way, and you tend to overestimate things as we did in 2017. The price got way too high, and then we tend to say, oh, well, it's over. Let's all go home. I guess we're just going to go back to the way things were. The problem is we can't go back to the way things were. The Internet stopped that. We live in a global economy now. Information moves at the speed of thought. And if information moves at the speed of thought, it means money is going to do that. Assets are siloed. They live in exchanges. We have stocks and bonds and gold and all these things, and we look at them as different things. But the reality is that their representations can be universal, almost like a stem cell for finance. And that's the point of our movement, is to talk about the DNA of how the world works how our identity works, how we vote, how we own property. What does it mean to own property? What does it mean to have wealth? The representations of it, the movement of it. There's a big regulatory conversation right now. The most expensive thing if you ever run a bank is your compliance desk. It's a miserable job. You have to learn everything about your customers, KYC, AML, anti-terrorist financing, and at the end of the day, if they do something naughty, you know what you're supposed to file? If you're in the banking industry, you know these words well, suspicious activity report. In other words, you have to tattle on your own customers. It's the world we live in. It's a world that also means that it's really hard to bank three billion people, because it turns out we don't have enough of their story documented. Wouldn't it be nice if we had a different way of doing that? It's the point of our movement, is that every one of these topics, whether it's important to me, it's important to somebody, somewhere, and it's impacting someone's life, somewhere. See, when I first joined this movement, I was enthralled by this concept of decentralized technology. I really loved the protocols, I loved proof of work, I loved UTXO accounting. I was like, wow, that's a data flow graph, wow. Bitcoin script's kind of cool. I mean, fourth is a really old language. Who would be crazy enough to, to build a scripting system from that? And it was really a selfish endeavor. I couldn't care less about what people felt or thought. It was just, I like the tech. I like open source projects. I enjoyed these things. And little by little, as I traveled around the world and I got to meet people, everybody had a story. And it usually started with something like, I have this problem, or we face this problem, or we had to endure this. I remember the first time I went to Argentina, I had a chance to meet an older gentleman, and told me a story about the many monetary collapses he had to endure. And he showed me where he buried his silver after the government's money went bad. Then he told me about how the police showed up and stole the silver. So then he went to his backyard and showed me where he buried his other silver, because the first was a decoy cash. <laughs> that's how clever these people get, but that's the reality that people live. 
in Venezuela, reality they live in Zimbabwe. And after 2008, it made me think, how far are we in the United States away from that? We have 23 trillion in debt. Our leadership continues to get more and more incompetent. The global financial markets are not healthy. And we seem to be just kicking the proverbial can down the road. We have all these toxic derivatives floating around. Inflationary policy is never ending. And nobody seems to listen or care to actually solve real problems. It's a recipe for the world to start getting to a state where we're probably going to have some difficult financial times ahead. And if every time the collapses get 10 times larger than the prior one, you can imagine where we're going to be at. So what's the path ahead about? It's about how we can solve this problem. Not governments, not big corporations like Microsoft and Amazon and the Googles and the Baidus and all these others, but we can actually solve these things. You see, at the end of the day, what's so magical about the technology we build and so magical about this movement is it's mostly open source. We share ideas. If Justin comes up with something, I can take it. And if we come up with something, he can take it. If the Neo guys come up with something, it's free game. Same for Ethereum, same for Cardano. And it works just this way in the science. I remember when we first started publishing papers, one of my proudest moments when we published the Ouroboros Classic paper back in 2016. It was one of the first major publications of my company. Since then, we published more than 40. And more than 20 have gone through peer review at major conferences like CCS and Eurocrypt and Crypto. And just in those few short years, I've watched from just having a few papers presented to dozens to eventually dedicated tracks to having a conversation of skepticism and, okay, good for you, please move on to, this is really interesting stuff and I'd love to work with you. I'd love to collaborate. So the science community is composable and open. The code is composable and open. And what we have is now a Darwinian environment of thousands of ideas all competing with high financial stakes. At the same time, we have a legacy system that's not doing well. And we can see that. And these things are going to collide with each other, almost like a great Hegelian synthesis. And the collision, the outcome of that is still a bit milky to me, murky to me. You see, at the end of the day, we don't have to have a decentralized, open, and free and fair system. We can have centralized, hierarchical digital money. We can have social credit. We can have a system where an actor can shut off the access to your identity, your money, prevent you from traveling if you want. Or we can have a system that's controlled by you. There is no universal law that says society should work one way or the other way. It's ultimately your decision. Just like there's no universal law that we should have kings versus presidents, versus committees, versus members of parliament. These are decisions we make. And what our space is doing is it's a gigantic experimental petri dish where we're seeing real time how to do these things. To go to the practical, we're in Ethiopia. In fact, after this, I'm flying there. We just got done training a class of 23 women, 19 from Ethiopia, four from Uganda in Haskell. And it's very proud to see them succeed. But more importantly, we're going to start talking to the Ethiopian government about a supply chain management project. At the same time, we're going to talk to them about identity. And at the same time, we're going to talk to them about pretty much every other aspect of their government. Did you know that the prime minister of that country is a cryptographer? Broke codes during the Eritrean War. The only world leader who currently holds an advanced degree in cryptography. You think I can have a good science-based conversation with him about the merits of what we do? And if it turns out to be successful, what does it mean? It means 106 million people, a third of the population of America, about the same population as Japan, could be living in a more advanced economy than I do within 10 years. That's just me. What can you do? Where can you go? So the power of this space is the fact that whether it's circumstance or fate or just the fact that we're all due for a new governance system because of the internet, we all have the power to do these things. We all have the power to be able to have these types of conversations, to be able to engage with these types of leaders and think about the nature of how people should live throughout the 21st century. What rights should they have? How much privacy should they have? 
State of Texas is right now talking about passing a law that says if you're going to receive a cryptocurrency payment, you have to know the identity of the person pushing it to you. Think about how insane that is. You have an address, someone pushes you a transaction. I could make everybody in Texas a criminal if they pass that law. Is that good? Well, it depends on your opinion, what you value. And this is an interactive process. This is one that you control as much as me, and basically the decisions we make over the next five to 10 years, the direction we take the technology over the next five or 10 years are gonna determine ultimately how these things work. It wasn't too long ago that people made the same decisions for the internet. Netscape decided what the web browser was gonna look like, and the cookie was gonna look like, and the scripting language, JavaScript, was gonna look like. If you like e-commerce the way it is, that's because of them. Came up with a certificate. The decisions they made, you live with, for good or for bad. Had we adopted PGP, we wouldn't have passwords right now. We'd have a password-free internet. We didn't go down that direction. We went down a different direction. So similarly, the decisions the entrepreneurs here make, the companies make, will have these impacts on you, and eventually the world. And the stakes are a lot higher. Because this isn't just about money. This is about how you live, your freedom of travel, what you can own, what you can't own, the types of people you can do business with and the types of people you can't do business with, the level of privacy you're going to enjoy, your autonomy. That's what this is ultimately about at the end of the day. And that's why I'm still here after eight years, all the ups and downs. Sure as hell is not for the price. <laughs> Back when I joined, it was a dollar. We went up to $30. I said, wow, this crypto is amazing. It went down to four, and I said, I'm the worst investor in the world. Then it went up to 250. I said, oh, this is cool. I should buy some more. And then it went to 80. Then it went up to $1,200. I said, OK, finally, finally, we're there. Then it bled down over a whole year period to $250. And then I sold some angrily. And then it went up to 20,000. I just gave up. <laughs> And then I almost bought some at 17, and then it went down to 3,800. And I said, this is why I'm not a trader. This is, there's other people who do that. <laughs> anyway, it's not for the price. It's not for the markets. But in closing, a few key facts to remember. Our movement continues to grow. It's easy to get a little hopeless and think that the best times are gone. But there's actually more people in cryptocurrency today in 2019 than there were at the peak of the market in 2017. More businesses being started today, more venture capital entering the space, more diverse capital entering the space, stronger business models. Recently, Samsung just announced that apparently crypto is coming to their phones. Three to five years, that's going to be a standard for pretty much every smartphone, probably including the iPhone. And all these major consumer platforms, from Messenger to Windows itself, are prime candidates to integrate infrastructure. So our movement is growing the state of it is quite strong, and our greatest challenges we have yet to face. It's going to come when that legacy world comes collapsing down, and how we respond to that, and what we do with that. So, it's in your hands, I guess. Good luck. Thank you all for coming.